Hi, and welcome to Socratic Studios. Here, you can enjoy discussions about everything science with the best minds in the field. This episode, we spoke to Lara Southern, a PhD student at the University of Osnabrück, about her observations of lethal coalitionary attacks of chimpanzees on gorillas. Welcome, Ms. Southern. It's an honor to speak with you. Um, yeah, thank you again for having me. So my name is Lara Southern. I'm currently a PhD student at the University of Osnabrück, which is um, it's a small university in a small German town. Um, but I work in partnership as well with the Max Planck Institute, um, which is quite well known around the world. They have a lot of different um, affiliations. It's quite a global um, institution, and I work um, in partnership with the primatology department, uh, which is also located um, in Germany. So I'm 50-50. And I've been working in Luango National Park, which is where we made these observations for our latest um, published research. And I've been working there for the past five years on and off. I've been um, working with the chimpanzees there and living there for most of the time. But I'm currently now completing my PhD thesis which is actually of a different topic in, um, I study communication in chimpanzees, but these observations of what we're going to be talking about today, which is about um, interactions between two great ape species, uh, gorillas and chimpanzees, um, were observed over the time that I was living and working at the field site in Gabon. So sort of to begin our podcast with, in the beginning of your research study, uh, you mentioned interspecies and intraspecies violence. So do you think you could explain what is the difference between intraspecies and interspecies violence? And maybe you could explain what we currently know about these two behaviors as far as the great apes you study are concerned. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, so intraspecific, and it can get quite confusing, but I'll just um, separate the two now, because even sometimes after many years working, um, studying ecology, I st you, people still mix them up. So interspecific competition um, is a theory or an interaction in population ecology between members of the same species. So this is quite um, quite common. Really, it happens in humans, it happens in mice, it happens uh, across every taps, um, taxonomic level. Um, it's where um, members of the same species compete for a shared resource. So the most common example is like food. So it's like two, um, there's one food source and everybody wants access to the food source. It's a limited resource. Of course, there's competition that arises um, but we're all the same species. And usually this is, um, a it's more widespread, but it's usually milder because there's a, there's a evolutionary processes at play that are usually kind of stabilize the amount of competitors um, for every single, for, ev for a given resource. And interspecific competition is between two different species. And this, I would say, is rare, but is still quite common across many taxonomic groups. Um, is where two species um, that can be very different species and can also be very similar similar species. So, for example, amongst primate taxa, you sometimes have interspecific competition with different primate species competing for similar resources because they have a similar uh, morphology. They need the same types of food. Um, in a tropical rainforest, for example, you have this quite a lot at many different taxonomical levels. So you'd have birds competing for the same resource, uh, insects competing for the same resource, all the way up to larger mammals. Um, and so you know, just to give a little example of um, this in, in primates, this is quite widespread. And in the great apes, less so. Um, gorillas and chimpanzees, we have they do occur sympatrically, and sympatric means that they um, are sharing the same habitat across a lot of tropical Africa, all the way from the west across to the east. In most, pla in all places that gorillas occur, there are chimpanzees there as well, though not in all habitat types. So they do they do have some differentiation in how they use their habitats, but they are sympatric species, and we do see interspecific competition, although this varies at many different levels. And this is something we'll maybe talk about a little bit later in the questions. Yeah. Right. So, do, are there any like specific uh, things that they compete over chimps, chimpanzees, and um, gorillas. 
that they compete over that you studied? Yeah. So, um, so chimpanzees generally are more frugivorous than gorillas. So they have a different, and this is, this is one kind of mechanism ecologically that the way in which species differentiation occurs is with digestive flexibility. So in, within a, uh, within a given habitat, there's a limited amount of resources and species may um, evolve differently in order to best adapt to kind of utilize, maxima- maximize the resources available to them and to avoid competition because competition really is a, is a very limiting factor for all species. So they'll try, there, there are mechanisms at play. And in generally what we've seen with gorillas and chimpanzees, what we've come to understand is that gorillas have evolved um, a digestive system that they can really, um, they use a lot, they eat a lot more of herbaceous vegetation. So they spend a lot more time in swamps, um, just as an example. And chimpanzees really are focused on fruit and they've also developed um, the ability to hunt and to eat meat. And so um, gorillas have been observed on occasion to eat insects, but generally they are considered herbivores. Um, but in Luango National Park, which is what I'll talk about today, and this is something that's kind of important to note, is that there's really um, there's a wide range of habitat differences all over Africa where these two great ape species occur. And what is really necessary is for us to conduct studies in all of these places to really see the, the, the mechanisms at play and how different that may be at each field site. And so I'll talk today about Luango, but it's just important to keep that in mind that there may be differences. This is not happening all over um, Africa and all over where these two species occur. This is something very specific to the location that we're studying these two species in. And so in Luango, there's a really long dry season. um, And this dry season starts in about April and it lasts all the way through to um September October time so it's about half of the year we really we consider it the long dry season and it's very different to other areas um other places in Africa where the long dry season corresponds with a low fruit availability and what we see at Luango is that there's actually some fruit species which thrive in the dry season and this is there's a really high um fruiting period in the dry season for two fruit species which are key fruit species for both gorillas and chimpanzees. And these are just to give some examples. There's um, Sacroglotis gabinensis. Um, um, There's Strodia gabinensis, which is, we we use a lot of the time, we use local names. Sorry, this is why with the taxonomic names we use in the forest, we use a lot of the local names that are given um, to the indigenous people who who work there and who we work with. Um, so those are the names that I have off the top of my head. Um, but there's these really key fruiting species, which sometimes we've we've observed both species feeding in these huge feeding trees. So there's a really high level of fruit production. Um, and when we when we made these two observations, it was during a time when we were coming into into the the long dry season, and these these resources are 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 starting to fruit, but they're not like readily available and they're very like high value resource. And you have these concentrations of these big fruiting trees with a lot of high value resources that are, um, that are kind of collectively bunched in certain places in the forest. And we think we hypothesize and what's really important is that these are all just hypotheses. Uh, these are all just kind of, um, theories at the moment. We really need to do a long-term study to really understand what's going on. But from our past three years of observations, we found that these these high concentrations of very valuable fruit resources may be creating um, a landscape which is very um, conductive to this high competition um, mentality for both species. So they're very high value resources, which provokes a lot of um, high risk taking behaviors from both sides. So because they, they both want um, these high value fruits. So competition can only really arise if these chimps and gorillas are living in the same place, right? So um, where do chimps and gorillas coexist uh, throughout Africa? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and so it's what's really interesting is that they probably do coexist in a lot more places than we currently know or that we currently have information on. Um, because one thing that's really hard with great ape species is all of these observations that we're able to make come from long-term field sites. So places where it's taken a really, really long time. For example, just at Luango, it took us 12 years pretty much before we were able to make our first behavioral observation. So before we're ever able to kind of record um, these, these great apes living their normal lives without any interference from the way that we're affecting their behavior. And so it's a really, really, it's, it's hard to kind of get this, this level of data collection. And this is, we have such patchy um, research from all across the African continent because it's, the, these, these long-term field sites are quite rare. So in the places that we do currently have, I mean, their geographical range overlaps in many places, but what we know about the places in which they're actually interacting is still quite limited. And we have some reports from the Gulugu Triangle, um, which is in Congo. There are also sympatric over in East Africa, but these are two different subspecies, which is also interesting. And this might be something that we really want to look into in the future is how maybe um, different species and the way that subspecies are classified, this might affect as well the way in which they're interacting and using their different types of habitat. So that's also with mountain gorillas who occur at much higher elevations than chimpanzees. So their interactions are much less. But in Luango, we have the lowland gorillas and um, we have pan troglodytes troglodytes, which are the central chimpanzees. And so these, these two chimpanzees occur, and they really share a lot of their habitat throughout different seasons as well and different food resources. So we think that Luango as well is a really interesting place to study these two species. And even though gorillas and chimpanzees do occur across all of tropical Africa, I would say, um, we don't know so much about those other sites. There's still quite limited research that's come out. Right. So you mentioned that it took your team about like 12 years before you could actually get into the field and study the gorillas. Uh, could you explain some of the steps that you had to take before you were able to like actually, you know, study them firsthand? Like what kind of things you needed to do beforehand? Yeah, for sure. So I was there, as I said, like I was only, I've only been working with this project for about five years and it feels for me like such a long time, but there's so much effort and so much um, people power that really goes into the creation of a project. And so Luango, um, I'll tell a little bit about the story of Luango, but there's also many examples of field sites all across Africa where this has been done with other great ape species. Um, so we're the Luango Chimpanzee Project, which originally started as the Luango Ape Project with the idea to study gorillas and chimps and their, their habitat. And now the two camps are separated, but we still were, we're, we're talking all the time together. They both work under the Max Planck umbrella. And um, so basically what it involves is we call it the process of habituation. So habitu habituating the chimpanzees and gorillas to human presence. With gorillas, it's usually a little bit faster because once the silverback, once the dominant male has accepted um, human observers, then everything goes much faster with the females in his group because they follow on from the behavior of the, of the dominant male. With chimpanzees, it's a little bit longer because you have to basically convince all the males in the group that you are not a threat to their safety. And this is what takes so long because it's there's and we usually go through this long process of the first step is fear where they're really just there's this immediate flea reaction. So most of the time you spend just running after signs of chimpanzees in the forest without ever actually seeing them because they're much faster and much better at moving through a forest than we are. And then there's the curiosity stage. So they become really curious about us and they'll look at you from high up in the treetops and then they'll, there's the t stage where usually they, they test you and they'll come and they'll display at you. We call it a display when they shake branches and they kind of run past you, but there's still this level of fear. And then the fourth step, which we're, which is what we're always hoping for, is um, when they completely ignore you. And this is the case with our chimpanzees now, is that we would basically just become invisible people in the background who are, and then we're able to observe their behavior in a way that we know that human our human presence is no longer having an effect on their normal day-to-day -day lives. 
Right. And so like this process you described, is this something that uh, you've seen for most of the chimpanzees or is it like uh, some of them will be more docile, some of them more aggressive or do they all follow the same pattern? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And chimpanzees, it's really interesting. And I guess I personally have more experience with chimpanzees than gorillas, um, but I have spent some time with gorillas as well. Um, but chimpanzees, it's really amazing because you can see that each chimpanzee has such a unique character and personality, and they're all very, very different. And it takes, so with, with, with in Luangu, we were very lucky with the community that we're currently studying um, and Pandi, our dominant alpha male. So the leader of the group at the, at the time, he was the first one to actually accept us. And he, once he had accepted humans, it was like for him, it was just kind of a walk in the park. You know, he was he was really, he would come sit right next to us. He really wanted to always be really close to us. He was kind of curious. He was really funny. And with some of the chimpanzees, even today, even after all this time that they've been with us mostly every day of the year, um, they're still very nervous and they'll always keep their distance. And they really, they, they don't want anything to do with us. And they're always, at least they'll, they'll be the first ones down the tree, the first ones at the front of the pack. They don't really hang behind. They never look at us. And so you, you can see these differences so much. And there's a big difference is usually with chimpanzees with males and females. It's usually easier to habituate the males um, and the females. It usually takes a longer time. Um, and this makes perfect sense. Females have usually offspring with them. They're, they're also protecting and they have different um, needs. And yeah, so you can definitely see the different individual differences. Is, is it... Um... So how do you get these or how do you know it's safe to let these chimpanzees near you? Because sometimes they can be kind of aggressive, right? So how do you know it's safe to let them uh, come next to you? And how do you know that they're actually habituated to you? So, so all of these chimpanzees are completely free living. And it's not so much in the sense that we let them near us, but it's more that w they're, letting the, they're letting us be near them. It's, 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 it's very much they are the ones... When we come into their forest habitat, when we when we leave our camp every day and we come into their world, it's very much us who are kind of um, always taking the sign from them on when something is OK. So they're the ones who who kind of control the situation and they decide when it's OK for them. I it's always if at any given time a chimpanzee in a in a natural setting they could choose to not be around us. They could they could lose us in the forest in about two minutes time. They could just really wander off and they're so, so tactile and agile. And it's really, so it's very much them who make the choice to let us be around them. In terms of aggression, uh, we've, we've, as we have a very strict um, kind of set of rules that we always take when we're around any great ape species that we're following in the park. And we always keep a distance of eight meters. This is also to for disease transmission. So chimpanzees and gorillas, and all other apes are very susceptible to many diseases that are quite common in humans, like the common cold, respiratory diseases. And so we always keep this distance um, in order to protect both us and them. And in terms of aggression, as long as you are not making any kind of sudden movements or any a chimp a chimpanzee their their entire social world is based on what they like social interactions and because they never have any social interactions with us it makes no sense for them to waste their energy basically trying to interact with us they get nothing out of ag any aggressions from us because we're not part of their social world and so as long as you kind of establish these boundaries, our day-to-day -day life is really observing them and just watching what they do in and amongst themselves. We don't have any part to play in that. Okay, so um, moving on to our third question. Um, now getting to some of the uh, research you described in your paper, what were some instances uh, that the chimpanzees and gorillas were violent towards each other? Uh, you described lethal interactions. Yeah, so I guess maybe I'll start that question with what we had previously seen and then what we describe in the paper and how that was really different and why these interactions were so interesting to us. Um, so across all of Africa, where these two species co-occur, 
Um, there's only ever been reports of really um, mutual avoidance, which is what we say, like if the chimpanzees ever heard gorillas or if the gorillas ever heard a group of chimpanzees, the two species would always find ways in which they didn't ever really cross, cross paths. And it seemed both from both sides, it was quite mutual. And then what we had also seen from other sites, so in, I talked a little bit earlier about the Gulugu Triangle and what we've seen in Luango was these, um, I had talked about these fruit, these fruit bearing trees, which are of interest to both species. And we actually had cases before in the past where we saw both gorillas and chimpanzees feeding peacefully in the trees together. So we know that this is possible and this is what we would kind of expect, that these two species who have mutually evolved over thousands of years have very specific ways in which they go about living their daily lives in the forest. And this is why we were so surprised with our with the interactions that we saw in 2019, which turned into lethal interactions. And what happened, what happened there was um, in both cases, um, the chimpanzees were in were in uh, were in large groups, so we had all of our chimps together. And this is quite um, I wouldn't say rare for chimpanzees, but in Luango and chimpanzees in general, they have this fission fusion society, which means that they during the course of their lifetime, individuals in a family. They split off into smaller subgroups and they can spend sometimes days, hours, weeks away from in these tiny little subgroups. And then they come together and they're all very accepting as a community. We call them communities, not groups usually. And but they, they can also live their lives separately. So when you have 27 chimpanzees together for, for the Recambo community that we're in, this is quite a large group. And this large group had been on, um, we call it patrolling in chimpanzees, and this is when chimpanzees go outside of their territory looking for neighboring territories. And this is kind of, um, they patrol the boundaries of their home range and they will fight if they encounter other chimpanzee groups. So this is quite a common, this is common across all subspecies of chimpanzees. It happens um, to different, different degrees in each community, if each community kind of has their different way of patrolling in their area. Um, and so on both of the occasions with the gorillas, this was really interesting because they had gone look, they had gone outside their home range looking for other chimpanzee communities. And in the first encounter, they were coming back into their territory. And this is when they encountered the gorillas. And on the second um, encounter, they were just about to go outside of their territory. And this is when they encountered the gorillas. So we also, we do talk about that a lot in our study about how this kind of, um, this mentality of going to going out to fight may have influenced a lot of the way that they reacted to encountering the gorillas at those specific times. Would you like me to elaborate a little bit on the two, the two encounters or sorry if I didn't talk enough there about it? Oh, oh yeah, you, you, you can, you can elaborate yeah, on be, the encounters if you nice. want. That would be great. Okay. So yeah, I can just take you through a little bit of the, a little bit of both and just kind of explain what happened in each one. Um, so the first one happened in February and the, we were with a group of chimpanzees. And like I said, they had just come back from this patrolling event um, so this is important as well to note that all of the males are quite agitated at this time. They're quite, um, there's a lot of testosterone. Um, they're really kind of, they're coming back into their territory. They're doing a lot of drumming displays, communicating, and they were in a quite, um, dense part of the forest. And when they actually first had this first encounter, what we initially heard was just, uh, chimpanzee screams and barks. And I thought initially that they had um, found another group of chimps because it sounds very much like what they sound. They just scream. Um, it's very loud. It's, it's really, it's quite a, a chimpanzee scream has a really a strong vibration and you can really feel it in your bones. And so we were, we were following them. And when we heard this, and then I remember hearing um, the gorilla chest beat. So when gorillas, they do, and, and I think this is what's been shown so many times in movies with gorillas doing the big chest beats, but it really is like that in the wild as well. They have this quite, um, the sound that resonates quite strongly. 
And we heard this gorilla chest beat. And of course, this was something that was so surprising to all of us. And we were, so we started filming immediately. And we observed this fight between a group of all of our chimpanzees and one silverback male. Um, and a lot of uh, three of our chimpanzees were actually wounded in this fight as well. So it's important to note as well that it is high risk for them to go into these fights. It's not just that they're the they're the strongest or that it was an easy decision for them. Um, and so, yeah, this, this fight lasted about 15 minutes, the total encounter, the time that we say that they're kind of in the same area and there's a lot of vocal communication going on between them was about an hour, but really the fight scene was maybe about 15 minutes. Um, and that first, um, instance, they managed to capture a small, an infant gorilla. In the first case, it was a lot smaller than the, the than the second one. It was maybe about less than a month old, so really a new a newborn gorilla. Um, and we we didn't realize that they had captured it until about actually ten minutes after the fight. Um, and in the first encounter, it's they they do what they do a lot of the times with the prey species. They're very curious about it, and they they kind of they played with it a little bit more like a play toy. Um, but there was no, there was no real violence towards the infant. It was more curiosity, um, from a lot of the younger chimpanzees as well, who are much more playful and much more, um, kind of just looking at it as a toy. And unfor unfortunately, the chimpan, the gorilla infant passed away due to a lot of the, the handling because it was a very small, um, gorilla. So that was the first, that was the first event. And in the second event, um, there was a, a long fight scene between um, two female gorillas and all of our male chimpanzees and a lot of our female chimpanzees as well. And in that encounter, they were able to as well, the chimpanzees were able to um, isolate a young gorilla from its mother. And in that case, um, the gorilla infant was also killed. So yeah, those were the two events. Right. So um now, we know that gorillas seem to be much larger and much stronger than chimpanzees are. So uh, despite this, we also saw that the chimpanzees, as you explained, uh, were killing the gorillas much more often than uh, the other way around. So do you have any theories as to why this might be the case, like some behavioral or evolutionary differences that may have caused this to happen? Yeah, so this this relates as well about the grouping systems of both species. Um, so although they are both great apes, they live in very, very different groups and they've evolved um, to have these very different mechanisms. So gorillas form um, what, what we call harems, which is where you have a, one male and okay, it, it can be multi-male, but to some extent, you usually have a dominant silverback with maybe some subdominant males who are still allowed to be present in the group. But you really have one, one male who is fathering all of the infants in his group with multi-females. And you, so therefore, you usually have a smaller group. It's usually um, in Luongo, we see variations in group size, but I would say about... Um, in the first encounter, we only saw about five gorillas. So this is with all of the females. So a much smaller group sizes than what we consider our chimpanzee communities have four to, up to 45 individuals. So there's really a difference, firstly, in group size. And a gorilla unit is usually a very small family, right? Because you have the one male and then his females and their offspring. And chimpanzee society is much more complex because you have this um, collective community, but with different family lines within that community. And one thing that this enables chimpanzees to do is to form alliances. And these alliances, though they are present in the females, it's really strong and it's really clear to see that they form these alliances within, along the male lineage. So um, males... Um, collectively do a lot of activities together. And this, the, um, there's so much research that goes into this. A lot of people who are working with chimpanzees have been studying these at these long-term field sites is how these male alliances last throughout a chimpanzee's lifetime. So they're really strong bo bonds between the males. And this is apparent in so many different aspects of what they do in their daily lives. So I talked a little bit earlier about hunting. 
which is an activity that's very important for chimpanzees. And in Luango, similar to what we see at other sites in Uganda, also in Thai National Park, which is up in the Ivory Coast, is that we see this really um, collaboration, so strong levels of collaboration among males, along the male members of the community, and where they cooperate to do different tasks and to, um, yeah, to get better rewards, basically. So if five chimpanzees go hunting together, the chance of them catching prey is much stronger than if one chimpanzee goes after the prey. And they've obviously come to understand this over time, which means that they do a lot of activities collectively. Patrolling, for example, when they go outside of their territory, all males bond together and they do this activity collectively. And we saw this very clearly in these interactions that a gorilla family, although they're very tightly bonded, one silverback male who is the defending male, even though he's much larger in body size, um, was not able to collectively defend his family against this um, collaboration or coalition that was formed amongst the chimpanzees. And it was really interesting to see this with the chimps because it wasn't just with the males, which is what we usually see in a lot of the other activities, but females and even juveniles were very active in this fight um, against the gorillas. So it was really a collective joint community effort um, against kind of a common enemy. Uh, I guess, yeah, I guess just what are the evolutionary advantages of the way that gorillas um, organize themselves? Because like, wh why is there only one male protecting um, the entire uh, group? So in most cases, it's it's quite interesting because this is something that hasn't really been observed. So gorillas, they don't um, much like much like humans and um, chimpanzees, gorilla, the great apes. We're we're closer to the top of the food chain, right? So I mean, humans, were we've kind of we've put ourselves way up there. Um, but chimpanzees, gorillas, great apes, these larger mammals in their rainforest habitats, they have very they have really their 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 sole predators are leopards. Um, and then humans for, for meat, but this is much more recent. Um, but in the sense that the way that gorillas have evolved, there haven't been so many, um, I guess, evolutionary mechanisms that they've needed to protect themselves. The silverback is usually quite a strong, um, a strong, um, I guess, defying presence against any kind of, any kind of predator. And in most cases, this would, you know, this, this male, he's really evolved. He's almost double in body size of any of the other females in his group, and he would be a sole protector. And what we see is with when chimpanzees, when they're able to form this coalition against a species, which is usually these two species don't come into interaction with each other, any, in any other given situation where the chimpanzees probably were not able to form this coalition or were not able to collectively attack um, they wouldn't have won. This is really the mechanism that enabled them to defeat or capture an infant gorilla. If you ever put one chimpanzee male against a, a large silverback, the size difference just would be completely overwhelming. So it really it was that collective action that enabled them to to attack the gorillas. Right. So when you were looking at uh when you were looking at the two different uh, fights that you mentioned and every, any other interaction between the chimps and the apes, did you see the chimpanzees mostly instigating the violence or the gorillas more? Yes. Yeah, so from, from the get go in both interactions um, with, with the first interactions, it was very hard. As I said, it was quite a dense area. And I, as I said before, like the first screams that I heard were just chimpanzee screams. Um, but in the second event, we saw it much more clearly that it was very much our chimpanzees who instigated the attack in both in both cases. And we think when we when we talked a lot about like our um, our hypotheses of why this would happen, of why these chimps would choose to engage in this like lethal violence. Um, we think it has a lot to do with them being on these on this patrolling behavior of being on the outskirts of their territory. It comes, I think, their motivations would it would come much more down to territorial defense, which can it's it's where we see these really um, 
these boosts of testosterone across the males. So they really go into this kind of mode, which is a defense mode where they're protecting their family, they're defending their alliance, they're defending their friends. Um, and they're really, it's kind of like fight or flight. And they chose in both cases to, to fight against, um, against the gorilla species. So I would say very much in both of these attacks, it was the chimpanzees who, in, who instigated um, the attack. And it was very much the gorillas on the defense who were trying to defend themselves and get away. So could you speak to the significance of your observations? Um, how can these interactions help us understand chimp and gorilla intraspecific behaviors? And um, what, what can we understand now that we didn't before? Yeah, so I think that these observations... Um, the first thing we did is when we when we observed this is we started talking to researchers um, from all across Africa where these two species co-occur to see if anybody had ever seen something that was similar to this. And we found out that no, these were really, um, these are the outliers. This is the first time that, um, it, at least in the scientific community, and it's also important to note that, that these two species have been coexisting for millennia and these, these interactions may have been formed by a multitude of interactions from from a long 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 history um so it's important to maybe note that we're just kind of stepping into one part of the story and there's still so much that we need to understand about what's really going on and where this um the collective actions that took place um in order for this to happen so maybe we're just kind of opening the book page without really understanding the beginning but I think at this point in time, it's it's really interesting to to look at these interactions and to understand these as um, yeah, this interspecies, these interspecies interactions that really is such a at such a high level um, of risk for both for both species, where it doesn't really make sense why they would enter into this fight for no real kind of benefit, at least um, from what we understand in terms of ecology, in terms of how these two species, how they've co-evolved, and every all the kind of information that we have currently, um, these two interactions really go against that, and. So what we need to do now is look into specifically what is happening at Luongo and what were those two, what, what are the similarities and differences in both those two events and any events that will um, arise in the future. And what we really need is a larger sample size um, in order to understand. And of course, we hope that there's no more. Um, we're not we're not advocates for for chimpanzee and gorilla warfare. We hope that these these are rare events. Um, but um, nonetheless, it's still really interesting um, to understand what high levels of competition really brought these um, encounters into play. Right. So sort of as a concluding question now, I wanted to ask if you could spearhead another um, sort of research expedition, like uh, analyzing chimp and ape behavior or chimp and gorilla behavior, what sort of things do you think would be the most important to uh, look after specifically now, uh, if you could decide? Yeah, and so I would I would maybe just talk quickly, briefly about the our kind of our th what what we outlined in our research paper and our publication um, was about the three hypotheses that we kind of thought could be probable um, reasons as to why these events happened. But of course, these were kind of research avenues that we want to look into in the future. Um, so our first, when we started thinking about why this why this could have happened, um, we thought about um, hunting behavior, which is something I've talked about. So chimpanzees unlike gorillas, they do collectively hunt. Um, and in the second event, what we did observe is that there was um, meat consumption of the gorilla infant by one of our, by one, by one chimpanzee. And so we had this idea that maybe they, it could be that chimpanzees are targets targeting infant gorillas as a prey another prey species because they hunt a lot of the time they hunt a lot of different monkey species a lot of different diker species i don't know if dike dikers they're small antelopes um and 
uh, yeah, there's a, there's a huge range of different species that they they attack. And so a lot of um, when we talked to other scientists as well, they were saying, well, maybe they're just targeting small gorillas as a different type of prey and they see them as food. This doesn't really fit. It doesn't answer all of the questions. It doesn't really make sense. It's a huge risk to to fight a group of gorillas for the potential chance that you capture an infant. Um, so we we kind of outlined that one, but it's something definitely to see in the future. We keep these really open minded. We don't say that we have the answers to why this happened. Um, and what we discuss most in our paper is um, competition. So we really wanted to look into the um, the situation of both of these events. And what we kind of came down to is that. Um, these two events occurred in months where there was um, low fruit availability and really there was these, these really important fruit species that are important to both chimpanzees and gorillas. And this may create an environment um, in which the, comp the levels of competition are so high that the risk of fighting between the two apes is um, the, the high reward is worth kind of the payoff um, of the fight. And and that we kind of end on the idea that chimpanzees may view gorillas in the same way that they view other communities of chimpanzees around them. So what we see a lot of the time is that fights between neighboring communities of chimpanzees are very common um, in Luongo. This happens many times during a year. There's fights between the two communities with a lot of losses of on both sides. And so chimpanzees may just be seeing gorillas as another kind of intruding group to their area, and they're defending their, their resources, their territories, their family in the same way that they would do against another neighboring community of chimpanzees. But it just happens that we see this um, on an, yeah, on an interspecies level rather than an intraspecies level. And so, yeah, those are the kind of three, I guess, main kind of research umbrellas of the way that we kind of want to investigate this in the future. And we kind of keep those as open minded um, theories as to why this could be happening. So those are basically all of the questions we had. Thank you so much, Mrs. Southern, for um, for speaking with us today. We had a lot of fun. It was really interesting talking to you about your research. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. It's really, it's great. It's great to talk about this. It's great to talk about Luongo. It's great to talk about chimpanzees and great apes. And yeah, thank you. <laughs>